Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, we better get started. My name is Philippa Mason and I'm the Scottish Development Manager at Glaucoma UK. Today we're going to be talking about who can help you with your glaucoma and what support is available between your clinical appointments. I'm also delighted to welcome our speakers, Joe Fishwick and Ellis, <laughs> Ellis Elliot, sorry, Alice Elliot. Um, Joe and Alice are Eye Clinic Liaison Officers, or ECLOs for short. Joe can be found at the West of England Eye Unit in Exeter Hospital, and Alice is based at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. So between Joe in the Southwest, Alice in West Yorkshire, and me in Aberdeen, I think we've got the length of the UK covered. Today's session is one of a special series of talks that Glaucoma UK are running for World Glaucoma Week. If anyone has attended a previous digital support session before this week, you will know that we usually have a wee introduction and then we ask a consultant or an ophthalmologist or an optometrist to do a presentation about a particular glaucoma issue. Now for this campaign, we wanted to change it up a bit and look at things from a slightly different perspective. This week, we are concentrating on hearing about patient experiences and the support services available to you outside of that clinical, strictly clinical setting. Joe and Alice both work for RNIB, and like Lacoma UK, they are a charity offering all kinds of support to people who need it. As charities, we work closely with NHS services and with each other to try to ensure that you have the right support at the right time. Today we'll be talking about some of the many support services that we provide and answer any questions you may have. Okay so that's my first bit over and done with. I should probably tell you about some of the services that, are, that Glaucoma UK offers to people um, anywhere, anytime. Glaucoma UK is the UK's only charity specifically for glaucoma. And we work in three main policy strands. Firstly, we campaign to raise awareness of the disease. We want people to know what glaucoma is and the importance of getting your eyes tested. The earlier glaucoma is diagnosed, the less likely people are to experience sight loss. Secondly, we provide support and advice to people with glaucoma and for those who care for them. We provide a variety of services that I'm going to cover in a minute. And we also provide training and advice to professionals looking after people with glaucoma. All our services are free to access. Finally, the third strand is we fund research into the diagnosis, treatment, care and prevention of glaucoma. Now, we're a small charity. We don't have huge, huge amounts of money to throw in, but we do provide initial funding for seed projects and early stage research, which helps to get projects off the ground and moving. We're majority funded by the generosity of our members and supporters, some of which are here tonight, and I thank you very much for that. OK, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, our helpline, our glaucoma helpline. This is one of our most popular resources. It's open from 9.30 till 5, Monday to Friday. It's staffed by an ophthalmic nurse and an extremely experienced advisor. And it's open to anyone in the UK who needs advice about their glaucoma. Unfortunately, it's not a free phone number, but it's only charged at local rates, so it should keep call costs down. You can also email your queries uh, to helpline at glaucoma.uk. Um, especially if you're out of hours, for example, you might think, oh, I have a burning thing that I need to ask. Let's get it down in an email and then hopefully you'll, you'll receive a, uh, an answer when the office opens again. We get approximately one and a half thousand calls a year on this helpline. Uh, and although obviously all glaucoma is different and all patients are different, we can kind of group the vast majority of responses into some key areas. The majority of, of calls are regarding eye drops and people who are struggling it, uh, instilling their eye drops or having any side effects. We have many calls about surgery and people anxious uh, about surgery that they'll be uh, due to have. Laser is also another popular uh, reason people call. Driving uh, and DVLA and the fitness to drive test, we get a lot of calls about that. We also get calls about lifestyle, 
and about delayed appointments. And that's something that's coming up a bit more now, um, especially over the last two years. We've seen more calls about people's uh, appointments for their glaucoma checks being kind of bounced uh, forward or cancelled, and they're not quite sure when the next one's going to be. I apologise, I keep looking down at my screen. My um, PowerPoint mouse isn't working quite as effectively as I wanted today. Apologies for that. The next resource I'm just going to mention is our website. Um, it's a really great resource. It's um, got a multitude of, of information on it. Um, so out of hours, if you have a question or you have a concern or a worry, please feel free to go onto our website. Um, we've recently rebranded and redesigned it, so it looks a lot better. Hopefully the information is laid out in a much more accessible way. Um, and you can do all sorts of things on there. You can download leaflets and booklets and information. You can sign up for Bacoma support groups. And you can find out more about becoming a member or supporter. Um, a lot of it is, is based on a kind of question and answer format as well. So I guarantee if you've had that question, we've probably thought about it and you're, you're likely to find it on the website. The next resource is our free leaflets and booklets. And the reason these are available anytime, anywhere is that they can be uh, downloaded off of our website. We have a really, this is only four examples on the screen uh, of the kind of variety of leaflets that we provide. So we provide very general information about glaucoma. We have here the first one, glaucoma a guide. Um, this is very useful if you've been newly diagnosed, for example, um, maybe you want to, uh, have it in plain English, uh, have it written down in front of you. Maybe you want to talk to a family member um, about the condition. Um, that leaflet is great because it has diagrams and we really break the information down to make it more accessible. Um, there's information about glaucoma in your relatives um, because of course glaucoma is more prevalent if you have a close family member who has glaucoma. Um, then we look at specific issues like eye drops and dispensing aids. Again, very common uh, issue that people bring up. And finally, we have a few leaflets about uh, associated conditions or side effect type conditions of glaucoma and glaucoma medications. So these include dry eye, we have a good leaflet on dry eye, and one about nephritis. Another resource that I wanted to mention, which is really starting to fly, is our Health Unlock Glaucoma UK Forum. Um, now, this is an area where um, we, we've always had a forum, uh, but this one is, is, is a lot better. Um, you can find it by going on to Health Unlocked, uh, searching for, for glaucoma, and then you can sign up for it, um, and then you'll be able to see uh, something like that's on the screen. Um, what it allows you to do is talk peer to peer. So talk to people who are going through glaucoma experiences and to share your experiences. It could be that you're due to have an operation or you've changed your drops or you're just feeling uncomfortable with a particular aspect of your glaucoma. You'll find that people are very supportive on here. People have lots of information and it's a moderated forum, which means we're always there in the background, making sure information is clear, correct uh, and relevant. We offer a buddying service. Um, the buddying service is, is really for people who are going to be undergoing surgery uh, and are feeling nervous about it and want to speak to somebody who's undergone that surgery or treatment. What we do is if you contact us, we try to pair you up with one of our volunteers um, and then you're able to either speak to them on, on just a single telephone call or maybe a series of chats just to have a chat to them about, for example, how long did it take you to recover? Was there much pain? What could you do afterwards? Um, just so you can get some reassurance of someone who's actually been through it. This is a quote um, on the screen at the moment from someone who used our, our buddy service. And I can't read it because I've got my face over it, but just a second. This is the quote. I probably wouldn't have been brave enough to have my trabeculectomy if I hadn't spoken with my buddy. Because I was matched with someone who had already had the procedure, it gave me the reassurance I needed to make an informed decision. So you can see it, it can be useful for those types of, of things. The final um, kind of main support mechanism we offer is glaucoma support groups. Um, on your screen at the moment, there are two photographs, uh, one of which is in Edinburgh, a glaucoma support group in Edinburgh, um, and the other of which is my colleague Subash doing a support group in a Sikh temple in the southeast of England. 
Um, Pre-COVID, as we say, we would be out as development managers on the road a lot, traveling around and doing groups. And when the situation changes again, we will be back doing that. Um, in the meantime, we have um, a series of digital support groups like this one, and we will continue to do them afterwards. What we've learned from this is a lot of people couldn't come to our groups uh, because they were too far away, they couldn't get there, um, many different reasons, and these digital support groups have really helped make it more accessible. Final area that we can help you on is if you are having difficulty with your eye drop medication and you're thinking maybe a dispensing aid might help you uh, self-manage your, your condition a bit more effectively. Um, Glaucoma UK do sell dispensing aids at not-for-profit um, and we've done lots of tried and tested uh, experiments really on them for years and years to try to find the best ones. Um, I often go into people's, um, uh, speak to people and they bring their dispensing aids and maybe they have four or five different ones that they've bought and none of them are suitable for the medications they're on and they're just a waste of money. Um, so what's preferable is to give us a ring, have a chat with us and we can make sure that we advise you of the right aid to buy for your particular medication. And some of them are actually available um, in Scotland uh, and, and in, in England, I think, uh, free on prescription. Um, so, um, you know, we can help advise you on that as well. Just before I pass over to Joe and Alice, um, I just wanted to talk about some of the other sources of support. Um, if you are feeling concerned between your eye clinic appointments, you can always call your hospital eye clinic or speak to your consultant's secretary. Now, I know we all feel at the moment with COVID and with how busy the eye clinics are, we think, I don't wanna bother them. It's probably fine. It's probably me just worrying. If you have a concern, do not hesitate, especially if it's about your particular condition rather than a kind of general glaucoma query, do not hesitate to give them a ring. Um, the advice that we're giving from our office is um, you should call the eye secretary to chase up an appointment if your glaucoma isn't being well controlled and you need to be seen regularly. If you've been newly diagnosed, you should be being seen two to three months after your diagnosis. If the gap is four months or longer, you should be chasing that up. If you feel your vision has changed since your last appointment and you are concerned, give them a ring. And if you have changed your drop medication and there's been no follow up to see if they are working in controlling your IOP or your interocular pressure, definitely give them a ring. Now, if you've had glaucoma for a number of years, everything's well maintained. There's no deterioration or change. It's probably OK for you to wait a bit longer. They shouldn't cause a problem. But if you have any concerns at all, don't hesitate to give them a ring. If you can't for any reason get hold of them, I know they're busy, um, you could try the PALS department or try to speak to your ECLO and they will be able to help you. It's also worth, we know they're busy, we know that lists are long. It's also worth checking with, a, with appointments whether they have a cancellation list. If so, you can be asked, you can ask to be added to that list. Okay, so that's the first port of call uh, if you're worried about your glaucoma between appointments. And um, the second one I have here is optometrists and pharmacists. Optometrists are hugely qualified and can give lots and lots of information about glaucoma. They're able to do many of the tests that you're able to have in your eye clinic. So it's definitely worth talking to your optometrist if you're worried or concerned. Similarly, with pharmacists, eye drop medication, if you're having issues or concerns, it's worth having a chat with your pharmacist, even if you're just going through side effects or possible issues. Next on my list is ECLOs or local equivalents. Now, Joe and Alice are going to talk about what ECLOs do in a minute, so I don't want to be talking too much about that. But if you don't have an ECLO, uh, an RNIB ECLO, you may have a local equivalent that is provided by a local sight loss sector organisation. OK, so it, they may be called a, uh, uh, something slightly different but they may do a similar role. And finally on this slide, there's national charities. As well as Glaucoma UK and RNIB, there are many, many others, including Guide Dogs, Thomas Pocklington, various other large organisations that all have services that may be able to support you.
Okay, I think that's as far as I want to go at this present minute. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides here. Um, and I'm going to start looking at the questions that you're, you're sending in to me. And I'm going to pass over, if that's okay, to Alice and Joe. Um, and if you'd like to tell us all about what the ECLOs do, what your role is, etc. Okay, um, thanks, thanks, Philippa. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I've had some, some problems with my, with my internet tonight, so um, please do bear, bear with me. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having us. We're, we're really delighted to be here um, and tell you a bit more about um, iClinic Liaison Officers, ECLOs for short. And our role, which is um, in short, to provide practical and emotional support at any stage of a person's eye care journey. And that extends to family members, um, carers, relatives, anyone really who feels that um, they're affected by sight loss. So um, as, as Philippa said, you know, a lot of ECLOs, I think probably the majority of ECLOs are employed by the, um, the big national charity, the RNIB. Um, not all of us, some are NHS staff, um, there's local societies, other sight loss charities um, employ ECLOs. Um, Joe and I, who are with you tonight, are both RNIB um, um, ECLOs. Um, however, as, as Philip has just said, you know, almost all eye clinics have some kind of ECLO service. They might not call it ECLO. Um, and it's worth asking if there is simply someone to, to talk to. Um, if, 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 you're looked at, if, if they look blankly when, when you say um, I clinically as an officer or ECLO um, to, to the staff there. Um, it might not be face to face at this time. Joe's going to talk a little bit more about how our response to COVID um, shortly. Um, so, but having said that, we are, we are here, we are still working and offering um, the same service, albeit sometimes in a, in a different way. So um, as Philip has said earlier, we've, we've, we're sort of representing um, the, the North and the South here, uh, myself and Jo. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Huddersfield and Jo's in Exeter. But uh, we're trying to make our talk sort of relevant to, to the whole of the UK. Um, there are regional differences in, in how support is, is offered and organised. And the, the countries differ slightly as, as well. Um, but... Your, your local ECLO or equivalent um, will be able to, to steer you in the right direction um, and make sure that the advice they're giving you directly is, is relevant to you. So um, the idea behind ECLO, how, how it all began, is that it was, it, you know, it was felt that there needed to be somewhere safe for, for patients to simply talk um, and, and, and get that support. Um, now, I think the idea at the time was it would be at the point of diagnosis, um, and that's still that's still the case. But we we tend to find that more often than not, we find that you know the pe people tend to come and talk to us more at the point of need than, than the actual diagnosis itself. But not, not always. But that that tends to be what happens. Um, often, when a person has reached a stage in their lives where they find that um, you know the sight loss has started to impact on their life. Um, so it might be that they've had a change of circumstance, um, means life's become more difficult, or it might be because they're having some difficulty um, at, at work or at school or at college, and, and that's what prompts them to feel that they, they could do with some support. Um, our colleagues, our clinical colleagues in, in, um, in the eye clinics do an amazing job, fantastic job, but um, they are under a lot of pressure to see patients quickly um, and keep their waiting times down. So, you know, and, it, and that's the case, as we know, more than ever, thanks, thanks to COVID. So um, it, it means they don't always have the time to properly explain um, what a diagnosis actually means or, or offer support. Um, and that's where the ECLOs come in. Um, so the ECLO service is really a point of support, information and onward referrals to, to further support and, and, and services um, locally. Um, so, for example, you know, the, some of the referrals we might make are, you know, we could refer to sensory teams for help, help to cope at home, um, mobility training, um, magnifiers, visual aids, help with eye drops, um, and um, all sorts of things, help to use a smartphone and tablets, 
Um, they can, there's a lot that, you, that technology can help in terms of day-to-day -day life. And there's also a national services um, offered by the RNIB, which we, as RNIB employees, um, the, those of us who are employed by the RNIB have, have, have really good access to, but non-RNIB ECLOs have, you know, are, are more than, you know, can, can refer into them as well. So we've got um, help to, you know, help to retain employment, welfare rights, um, counselling, um, talking books, living with sight loss courses. Um, and we've got good links with the other national organisations too. Um, Philip mentioned them earlier. Guide dogs, um, not just limited to, to having a guide dog, I should mention guide dogs. Um, they do a, a range of other services, particularly with ch children and families. Um, we've got Thomas Parkinson as well. And we also, you know, we like to work well with our, with our colleagues who work in, you know, um, site loss specific um, organisations as well. Hence us being here today with, with Qualcomm the UK. We've also got good links with the Macula Society, um, Nystagmus Network as well. Um, but, you know, a lot of people come to ECLO before, you know, before, before they maybe before the site loss has really has really started and they're wanting just sort of information about what's what's good what what is available or just simply talk through you know compliance with drops you know it is available um for anyone at any point in in their eye in their eye care journey um as, as i said earlier um and um oh yeah and we we at close really do try and stay well connected um with their with their local areas so you know, it might be that there's a really, really good um, welfare rights charity um, available to, to local residents. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd be, you know, very happy to make referrals there um, or really, really supportive um, assistive technology group. You know, we're, we're not, our main concern, our main, you know, our main concern is making sure a person can get support. We're not, we're not too worried who provides it as long as that person gets good quality support. Um, the ECLO um, is also a sort of a, a key um, component to um, when a person is ready to become certified and registered as, as visually impaired. Um, and I just thought I'd talk about that um, briefly. Um, so it's, it's a voluntary process, um, sort of becoming registered, um, and it's entirely up to an individual as to whether they want to, to go ahead with it, um, or, or up to the parents if, if the person's a child. Um, there's two levels, um, sight impaired and severely sight impaired. Um, so for sight impaired, we would, um, that used to be called, or still sometimes called partially sighted and severely sight impaired blind, but the two, two terms, you know, interchangeable really, but um, we usually say sight impaired and severely sight impaired. And there are clinical guidelines which determine eligibility, and then they are just guidelines. It's the, and the, the final decision lies with the person's consultant. Um, and, um, and yeah, whether they want to issue a certificate of visual impairment, um, a CVI for short. And like I say, so it, it's, a it's a decision that um, is made between the, the consultant and, and, and the person themselves. Um, you know, the main reason we, we, offer, we offer this, this paperwork, in, is to put that person in touch with the sensory team at their local authority. Um, and that's sort of where the person would get further um, support, information, help to um, um, sort of help, help and tips to cope with the practicalities of day-to-day -day life. Um, and, you know, it can be as much or as little as, as that person wants or needs. Um, so as I, as I understand it, every local authority in the UK has a sensory team. Um, and, um, you know, there, there are regional and, and variations um, over the UK, but um, your, your local ECLO or, or equivalent service would be able to steer you in the right direction if you were interested in becoming um, registered um, sight impaired or severely sight impaired. Um, and um, yes, as I touched on before, you know, we're based within eye clinics, um, but that doesn't mean the support is restricted to those actively attending the eye clinic. Um, sometimes, you know, at the point of discharge can actually be the kind of, you know, the worst part of, of the whole experience. Um, people can feel quite sort of left, left to drift sometimes. Um, and that's maybe when, when the ECLO service becomes, becomes, becomes most relevant for them. Um, and it, you know, it might be that, um, that you know, for some people, they, they might not attend the eye clinic for years 
you know, they might have been discharged um, and, you know, back into the care of their local optician. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that the ECLOV service is closed to them. Um, our number is, is, is free to anyone, really. Um, and if we don't know how best to support, to support you, we'd, we'd go away and find someone, someone who does. Um, so, you know, we're often, we're off, we work closely with, with GPs and optums to say, you know, please, please don't forget about us. Just because a, a referral into the eye clinic might not be appropriate, you know. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that we might not, that the ECLO might not be able to help them. So finishing up um, shortly, but um, a bit about me. I've been in the role for nearly seven years. Um, so clearly something's gone right. Um, longest I've ever been in a, in a job before. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a great job. Um, my sort of background is that I'd worked in the voluntary sector um, prior to, to becoming an ECLO. I've been a benefits advisor, an advocate, and a volunteering coordinator. Um, people often ask me sort of how, how, how does one become an ECLO? Um, do you have to have, you know, a, a knowledge of, of eye conditions or anything like that? And, and the answer is no. Um, you know, em empathy and listening skills are really important. And um, on, on, on being offered a job, all ECLOs are required to take an accredited training course um, within their first year in post. And there's um, it's a sort of four day course and there's coursework and an exam at the end of it. So um, we are, you know, we, we, do, we do do a training qualification, but it's generally offered when, you, when you're actually in post. Um, so we're, we're not medically trained, um, but you, you do naturally pick up a lot of information about eye conditions and, um, and compliance with treatment through, through working in an eye clinic setting. So I think that's my bit um, pretty much done. So um, I don't know if I'm... Thank you. Anything. Alice, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. That's really informative and, and telling us about the kind of things that you offer um, as Eclos. I mean, I didn't know about a lot of that yeah. stuff, but it's really wide service, you know, it's a lot wider than just, you know, uh, you can get welfare information and you can get information on technology. I mean, I think that's wonderful. Um, that's great. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Joe. Joe, can I just ask you to sit slightly right so we can get yep. you in the camera? Um, there, uh, a little bit further to the right. Perfect. Joe, hello. That's wonderful. Hi. Brilliant. I'm going to mute myself, Joe. Please go for it. Okay. Hi, everybody. So my name's Joe, and I job share with another ECLO at Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. I job share with Tess. Um, so I've been in post for two years now, just a smidgen over. Um, so forgive me if I've got a guide dog here called Bruno um, or the diva retriever, as we call him. And um, I'm just dreading him starting to have a dream while I'm talking to you all. So um, do forgive him if he does. <laughs> so um, I was going to talk a little bit about the COVID response from RNIB, really, and the ECLO service and then talk a little bit about concessions and services. I know Alice touched on some of them, um, but just to give you an overview of what's available so um, when sort of early last year um, I was in clinic in Exeter, you know, merrily being an ECLO and that meant meeting patients face to face, offering support, sometimes going into appointments with patients, which is something we can do to help them ask questions if they're feeling a little bit um, that it's difficult to ask those, you know, questions to a consultant, perhaps they're feeling a bit emotional about a diagnosis so we can attend appointments with patients. And basically for me, I was in clinic one day and then the next I was told to go home um, because of COVID. But very, very quickly, the RNIB jumped into action and launched um, wellbeing calls. So as ECLOs, we contacted as many patients as possible that we'd seen over the past 12 months um, and called them to see if they were able to access medication, prescriptions, shopping, um, food, um, information, finances, and if they had support. And it was amazing, the innovative things that patients were coming up with. You know, um, I had one lady who was 
had a really lovely neighbour who was reading food packaging over the fence for her because she couldn't have anyone else in the house because she'd been told to shield. So she was, you know, getting help from a neighbour. Um, but we were making referrals to the NHS responders to get people emergency shopping, to get them medication, which was amazing to be able to do that. Um, and all the R and I B ECLOs um, did that, and I'm sure other ECLOs did as well that are non R and I B. Um, so then we were doing what we called stay in touch calls. So if we identified patients who were struggling, we could phone them once a week for a quick chat just to see how they were doing. What, did they have any struggles? Were they accessing the things that they needed? Did they have support? And I've still got a couple of those ongoing now, you know, a year down the line, I'm still contacting patients and just to touch base and let them know that there's a listening ear, really. Um, and that's been amazing. That's been such a lovely thing to be able to offer. And I know that lots of other charities and sight loss organisations have been doing that as well. So between us, hopefully we've reached lots and lots of people. So I'm still working at home. Um, because Exeter is a really, really busy clinic. And because of social distancing, they've had to move people around and put people, separate people who would have normally been in one big room. So um, they, um, they've kind of asked us to remain at home. Um, hopefully that won't be for too much longer. Um, but so, so normally an ECLO service is face-to-face, -face, as Alice said, but at the moment for me, it's over the phone. Um, or online but that's that's okay you know um, we we can still offer a service um, we can ask the hospital to send out information on our behalf um, we're still doing certificates of visual impairment for those who want to be registered or for who that's appropriate um, so yeah so that's that's how it is uh, for me at the moment I can't say working from home is always easy <laughs> But, um, but it's, you know, I've been doing it for a year now, so I've got quite comfortable with it. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I was going to talk about some of the services that we can do. So if you were registered as SSI or severely sight impaired, um, you are entitled to certain things that you wouldn't be entitled to if you were sight impaired. And one of these that we've been asked about an awful lot recently um, since the changes is the half price TV license. So if you are registered as severely sight impaired, you are entitled to that half price TV license. You're also entitled to blind person's tax allowance. And that's not just if you're working. If you pay tax on savings, you're entitled to that as well. And the at the RNIB, we do have a tax service who can help you with that, which is um, an amazing service and um, a good saving to be had. Um, so you would also be entitled to um, the disabled person's parking badge or the blue badge, as it's quite often known. Um, and you, uh, the disabled person's rail card and bus pass. And those are the kind of things that being registered SSI. Although it's a really it can be a traumatic experience losing, you know, losing your vision. Um, but there is a lot of support out there to just make life that little bit easier. Um, there are uh, we do have a benefits service at RNIB. We can do benefits checks. Um, so as ECLOs, we would refer you through to our site loss advice service and they could do a benefits check for you to make sure you're getting everything that you're entitled to. And if you're um, working age, you might be entitled to personal independence payments. Um, if you're over 65, then you might be entitled to attendance allowance. And if you need a carer, then they may be entitled to carer's allowance if you get one of the other benefits that I've mentioned. Um, and I always say to people, you know, don't, don't be embarrassed about claiming these things because you're entitled to it. And if you don't claim it, it will just sit in a pot and no one else will get it um, instead of you. So, you know, don't be embarrassed um, to, to claim these things and to get that extra financial support because having a visual impairment can be a costly affair. You might need a magnifier and it would help you to get that. You might need taxis because you would have to give up driving if you were registered. Um, so those kind of things. Um, signposting, we can, um, as Alice mentioned, we 
signpost to the sensory team and you don't have to be registered um, certainly in my case in Exeter or in Devon you don't have to be registered to have a referral to the sensory team we can do that anyway and get you some support even if you're not registered and they can chat to you about daily living skills um, offer things like um, liquid level indicators they can put tactile markings or bright colored markings on kitchen equipment they can help you with mobility, chat to you about lighting, all sorts of things. And I always say to people, it's a conversation worth having, even if you don't think it's useful at the moment, because there might be something that just strikes a chord with you. Um, we can do referrals to people like British Wireless for the Blind Fund, which is what it says on the tin, really. They can issue you with um, the old fashioned term, I suppose, a wireless, but um, yeah, so they can issue you with some audio equipment and that might be to help you listen to the radio or it might be to, and they're really accessible equipment or it might be to access your talking books and things like that. Um, for those who've served in the armed forces, we can do referrals to blind veterans. And then as Alice and Philippa both said, we've got the charities like Age UK, um, we've got local blind societies um, who quite often and um, through COVID, a lot of them have put things in place um, to really support people. Here in Devon, our local blind society have um, put in place um, a counselling service, which is great because the RNIB have a counselling service, but often there's a waiting list. Um, particularly at the moment, we know that a lot of people are struggling with mental well-being. So it's it's really good to be able to offer those services. And we can, with RNIB, we can offer an emer emergency mental health check-in should somebody need it. Um, so um, a question's just come through, how much vision do you need to be registered with sight loss? So um, only a consultant ophthalmologist can make the decision as to whether you're registrable. Um, but there are um, criteria. So your sight does have to be at a certain level to be registered SI or SSI. It is you know quite low sight low vision to be registered ssi but you don't need to be totally blind um but they will take into account loss of field as well so i don't think alice and i will give you sort of um any stats on that or any any specifics because it can be dependent so if for example you've got a couple of different eye conditions you might have macula which affects um, central vision but you then might have um, glaucoma which can affect you know peripheral so if you you know they will take into account your loss of field as well as central vision as well so um, the consultant will be able to talk through that with you um, so we've got the macular society and glaucoma uk and there's the diabetes society um, all of which are you know amazing charities that do really good you know support groups and like philippa said the buddy systems and things like that so always take advantage of those because sometimes it's really good to talk to somebody who understands what you're experiencing um you know being alone with it can be being, can be really you know cause a lot of anxiety and can be really stressful um Esme's Umbrella is another one um, that was founded by the lovely Judith Potts and um, some people who are losing their sight can get visual hallucinations um, and people are quite often scared to talk about it. Um, so as ECHLOs, we quite often mention it to people to see if they are experiencing any hallucinations and we can explain to them that it might be Charles Bonnet syndrome and ESME's umbrella is the support group for that. And the RNIB help with that as well. Um, so they, they have a support line where you can phone up and chat to somebody about what you're experiencing and they can give you coping strategies as well. Um, guide dogs, as Alice mentioned, um, not just for dogs. Um, they have children's services um, and they also do um, sort of I think they call it a quick a quick win or a quick fix so they can come and see you they have like rehabilitation officers and they can come and see you um obviously in during covid it's a little bit more difficult but I know that a lot of you know the certainly the um sensory teams and probably guide dogs they can kind of do doorstep drops or 
you know, um, socially distanced things if they really need to, if it's an emergency. But they can kind of provide you with, for example, a liquid level indicator so that you can make hot drinks safely. Um, so there are there's RNIB talking books, but there's also Calibre, um, which is another talking book service. And there's also local library services. And we can give advice on all of those in our particular local area because they do vary slightly but rnib talking books is a free service you just need the player and caliber at the moment is free as well um so the rnib services um, which alice was through uh, before so just to reiterate talking books and newspapers so rnib news agent at the moment can offer a three-month subscription to one magazine just to give somebody something to listen to um, during lockdown if that's something they would want and um, we have the site loss advice service and they can give you all kinds of information and do the benefits checks uh, children and young persons services um, housing employment um, counseling the emergency mental health um, we have talk and support groups um, which are small groups where people get together um, for a chat um, once a week. Um, we have the Living Well with Sight Loss courses, which are what they say on the tin, really. A group of people get together with a facilitator and they'll talk about lots of different things to do with, a, to do with sight loss or visual impairment. And that might be equipment, um, it might be magnification, it might be library services, it might be that they have speakers from other charities and they're really useful. Um, technology we have our technology for life team and they're really really good in fact um, my previous job with RNIB was as an assistive technology coordinator so it was my job to teach people how to use smart technology which I really enjoyed and was really re rewarding um, we also have our older persons and complex needs team so that's a real I mean there's loads more Alice and I could probably spend all evening telling you about the different services but just to give you a snapshot of what's available and you know never be afraid to ask for support um you know i've absolutely loved my job as an echo um you know as a as a i've got no sight at all myself um i was born with a sight problem and lost it gradually um over the years but it's it's lovely to support other people and to let them know what services are out there and to listen and you know to show empathy and to hopefully let them know that there is you know light at the end of the tunnel as they say and there is definitely support out there and uh, I think that's it from me you've probably that's heard wonderful. my voice enough <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely wonderful thank you Joe and Alice thank you so much for for telling us about the services um that you guys provide I mean I think what kind of comes through from that is the fact that the services that you can get to help you wherever you are um, in your glaucoma journey are wide and varied. Um, I think what we really want to make a point of in this situation is, is many people who are initially diagnosed with glaucoma or going down their glaucoma journey may never have significant sight loss. They may have very slow deterioration of sight, but they also may have much quicker deterioration of sight. Wherever you are, whichever point you're at, what we think is important is that people are empowered with knowledge about what is available for you along that journey. So you never feel um, lost. There's always going to be somebody there who will be able to tell you about the support that's there for you, whatever, whatever happens on your on your site journey. Um, thank you again. I just want to say that's absolutely wonderful. I've got a, a few questions that have come in. Um, Joe, thank you for answering that question live from Facebook as it came in. That was amazingly. <laughs> Well done. Um, I've got a few here. Um, one is about delayed appointments. Uh, someone's written and said, how long is the typical delay uh, with COVID if your appointment's meant to be six months? Um, from our point of view, we would say, obviously, COVID has delayed appointments. Uh, Joe, Alice, are you finding you're getting a lot of concerns about delayed appointments through to you? Yeah, and I think it does vary from area to area, depending on how big the eye clinic is, how busy it is. Um, so, I mean, from my point of view, Exeter are trying to 
catch up but for example you know cataract operations and other things are you know are delayed but they are doing their utmost to to catch up but I'm sure Alice's is you know possibly a similar story but it obviously does depend from clinic to clinic yeah yeah I, I would I, I would agree um and just to say you know if if you're worried please please call the eye clinic you're not being a nuisance you're not mm. you know we the eye clinics have run throughout all the lockdowns there's the services have never been suspended, um, especially not with glaucoma, because it's so important that yeah. it's kept, it's kept under review. So please phone up if, if you're worried. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Give them a ring if you're if you're worried. Um, we've got a question here um, about um, somebody who has been offered um, the option of having a trabeculectomy and they're not sure about what the benefits are um, compared with, for example, having MIGS. Um, I would probably say this is something you probably need to discuss with your consultant. Um, glaucoma is all very different. People's own health is very different. There's lots of reasons why your consultant might suggest a trabeculectomy over any other type of treatment. Um, what I can reassure you is trabeculectomy is seen as a gold standard type treatment. Um, many, many people have them. They're performed a lot over the UK. Um, but in this particular situation, I think you really need to speak to your consultant specifically um, about that case. Uh, MIGs are, are something that may be more prevalent in some areas. Sometimes it depends on the consultant that's working there. You have sometimes specialist mix consultants, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's any better or any worse or would be suitable for you. Um, so definitely have a, a chat about with your consultant. I've had a, a question here um, that said, and actually brilliant question, how do I know if my eye pressures are deteriorating between appointments? Absolutely. How would we know that? Because often people don't know they've got glaucoma. They have no idea that their eye pressure is high. Um, so absolutely, we, we wouldn't know. Um, I think that's part of the fear, I think, and, and what we hear from people who are calling us. I would suggest if there's been a delay in your appointment, that you call your eye clinic. Um, and, and try to find out when your appointment is. I mean, it could be if your glaucoma has been very stable for a long amount of time, you're maybe less concerned. Um, but yeah, don't live with that worry. Give them a ring. Um, I'm not sure, Joe or Alice, if, if you have anything to add on, on the fact yeah, of people worrying. And, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, because it's so important with certain eye conditions like glaucoma, it's really important to, to you know, to use the treatment to, you know, treatment compliance is so important. And there is you know um regular checkups to check those pressures and and just you know please don't hesitate and if you are struggling you know either contact your eye clinic liaison officer or contact the clinic and um you know get that support um speaking to somebody today who um you know was saying that she'd had the um surgery and she had asked them to write down all her drops in large print for her and color coordinated and they did that for her so there is you know support with that kind of thing as well never be afraid to ask questions and don't go away and think oh I'm going to really struggle with this treatment there is support for co treatment compliance absolutely and we would say you know if, if it helps prepare you better um I mean obviously in COVID times it's more difficult um mm. to have someone to come with you um but write down the questions that you want um be quite firm and assertive, I would suppose I could yeah. say politely. Um, yes. with, with your consultants. <laughs> we know they're busy, we know that they've got a lot on, but you have a right to feel confident that the information that's given to you, that you understand it fully and that you know what's what's going on and what you need to do. And don't feel don't feel concerned about questioning or asking why or saying, no, actually, I can't do this. Um, you know, so 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 don't be, be confident to feel that. Okay, I'm just having a look to see if there's any more questions coming in. This is your last opportunity for questions, guys. Someone's just said very helpful to hear about all the varied support services uh, required for myself and my friends. Thank you very much. Um, I'll leave that question box up just for a second. And while I'm doing that, I'm just going to put up my final uh, slide for today. I want to be a second. Um, well, okay, and um, Michelle. Uh, share my screen. You can tell it's getting late in the evening. My technical ability is starting to desert me now. Um, <laughs> I think I've maybe reached my technical competence levels. Um, all right, I'm just going to have a very quick check to make sure there's no more questions coming in here. No, okay. Right, I first of all uh, just want to leave this slide up um, at the end to say um, 
big massive thank you to Joe and Alice who have joined us today to talk about services that you guys do um, and I say from the bottom of my heart I work with Echoes in Scotland but my colleagues work with with you guys in England and Wales and you are wonderful and supportive and fantastic and you've always been um, able to give us information and, and signposting um, and we really really appreciate that so thank you so much for all the work that you do. Um, what I'm going to do guys if it's okay is just launch um, our last poll of the evening um, this is the one that tells me whether you feel that you've learned anything from our session um, I'm going to launch that now so if you don't mind just completing that for me um, it should be on the screen Just to let you know, we have our next talk tomorrow. Um, as I said, we have the annual glaucoma lectures tomorrow afternoon. And then tomorrow evening, we have uh, the final talk of the series, uh, which is um, 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 about, let me just check, I've now forgotten after telling you all of this, we'll be discussing glaucoma self-care and looking after your condition. That's wonderful. You're all filling in that poll for me. I can see you all, all the numbers are flying up. You're all wonderful. Thank you so much. Right, I'm going to turn that off now. Okay, just a final thing really is to let you know that you'll all be receiving a SurveyMonkey feedback form like we all do uh, with these things. Um, if you can fill that out for me, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, it helps us know what we're doing right. It helps tell us what you guys want to hear talks about and how we can improve in the future. Again, Alice, Joe, thank you, thank you so much uh, for coming today. If I haven't got round to questions um, on the list, please call our helpline guys, please email us and we'll be able to get back to you in more detail. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And I'll say good night. Thank you. Thanks, Philippa. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.